On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to discuss what everyone needs to know about angels. Gary Stimmon has written an article for our October 2009 issue of Prophecy in the News magazine in which he discusses angels and cherubs in history and prophecy. Gary, the first thing I notice you said here is there's a whole bunch of them. A whole bunch of them, J.R. Well, uh, when John went to heaven, he was utterly overwhelmed by the sight. In Revelation 5.11, he said, And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels uh, round about the throne, and the beasts and elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now, if you do a little multiplication, <clears throat> 10,000 times 10,000 would be about 100 million. And <clears throat> if you multiplied that by 1,000 thousand, which would be a million, I'm just freely interpreting what he says here, you come up with about 100 trillion, except the expression here is myriads and myriads. And I think the intent <clears throat> is not to come up with a specific number, but to suggest that there are an infinite number of angels. Heaven's got to be a lot bigger than this planet. <laughs> yes. This planet is kind of limited, you know. Uh, 1960, we had 3 billion population. Now, in the year 2000, we had 6 billion population, doubled in 40 years. If it doubles in the next 40 years, by 2040, there should be 12 billion by 2080. 24 billion by the year 2120. And that's not very long off, 2120. Oh, no. 48 billion people. And yet, there's enough angels for a guardian to every single person, isn't mm -hmm. there? Now, the angels are in different classes. They are called to different purposes. Uh, they, they seem to have different forms, actually. And, and some are very close to God's inner circle. Some are called heroes in Scripture, uh, like Gabriel, for example. Some are mm, just the faithful. They just stand by, waiting to serve. Some are wicked. Some are very, very wicked, like Lucifer, who became Satan. And so, J.R., you can't just say angel. You have to think of them as different groups and and we would almost think of them as different races, you know, some called cherubs, some called seraphs, uh, the overwhelming majority called angels, which comes from a Greek word that means messenger. So at least one of their roles is to act as God's messengers. And Gary, there's uh, an infinite number of species on our planet. Well, maybe not an infinite number, but a bunch. Mm. And since there are animals of various kinds and uh, some that fly, some that swim, some that walk on four legs, etc., etc., some that climb trees. Are there different species of angels as well? I think there are. Uh, for example, uh, the highest form of, of angelic being that we know of is called a cherub. Uh, Satan was once called the anointed cherub that covereth. In other words, he was one of the cherubs at the throne of God. And these, these angels uh, were created beings. They have special tasks. In fact, it's an amazing thing. David talked about God flying on a cherub, which I find amazing. Uh, David uh, really has a praise of the Lord. He says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and, and he did hear my voice out of uh, his temple, did cry, uh, and my cry did enter into his ears. And then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of heaven moved and shook, because he was wroth. And there went up a smoke out of his nostrils, fire out of his mouth devoured, coals were kindled by it. And he bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet, and... He rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. Now, that's, you, that conjures up a vision, the Lord riding upon a cherub. It reminds me of uh, a little bit maybe of Jesus in the New Testament when he comes back from heaven with the armies of heaven riding on what is called in Scripture a white horse, but maybe it's not a white horse. Think it could be a cherub? Maybe it's a cherub. <laughs> Now, could the cherubs be the uh, pilots of a celestial vehicle? 
I think they could be. <clears throat> Absolutely. I, it, it's fascinating when you look at, at cherubs. There were two of them on the Ark of the Covenant. And their roles seem to be witnesses and guardians. Uh, in ancient Assyria, there was a winged bull. Uh, and there were winged lions of Babylon and guarding the gates of Babylon. And we've all seen those uh, statues. Many of them still exist. You see this great posing lion, you know, with a sometimes has the face of a man and wings. And in both the Assyrian and Babylonian languages, those creatures were called kirubu, which is a, a copy of or just a variation of the word cherub. And so uh, the Assyrians and Babylonians thought that cherubs were animals with human faces and the wings uh, of birds. Like a chimera. Like a chimera. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> the first cherub we find in the Bible are those that the Lord put at the east of Eden to guard the way to the mm -hmm. tree of <clears throat> life. Yeah. And so right from the onset of scriptures, we learn that there are angels called cherubim. Mm -hmm. Now, there was an archaeological dig in northern Israel some years ago in which they uncovered what they thought was a stone replica of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, which looked kind of like a, a housetop, but there were two winged lions facing each other mm -hmm. on it. And they suggested, the archaeologists suggested that this might be a depiction of the cherubim on the, um, on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, J.R., that's not at all... Uh, out of the reach of Scripture, because when John went to heaven and viewed the throne of God, he viewed it as surrounded by four living creatures that are practically indescribable. Uh, the New Testament refers to them as beasts. Uh, it comes from a Greek word meaning living creatures, but they seemed to have animal-like qualities as well as human-like qualities blended into one creature. Yeah, there in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we yes. have one of the cherubim had the face of a lion, the other had the appearance of a man, the other had the appearance of an eagle, and so mm -hmm. on, and another a calf. And these, of course, are the four types of species on the planet. There's the winged kingdom, you know, of the birds, and there's man who is definitely the leading species on the planet. And then there are the uh, domesticated or tame animals uh, as seen by the calf. And mm -hmm. then there's the wild animals, uh, the wild beasts of the planet as uh, depicted by the lion. So uh, it, it looks like these four cherubim are, um, shall we say, guardians over these, are watchers over these four segments of the mm -hmm. earth species. It, it would seem so. And the cherubim seem to be uh, associated with flying machines, if you will. Uh, in First Chronicles 28, 18, there was an instruction that was given by, uh, by David to his son Solomon, and his instructions included this note, And for the altar of incense, refined gold by weight, and gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubims that spread out their wings, covered the ark, of the covenant of the Lord. That is uh, 1 Chronicles 28, 18. So there's something called a chariot of the cherubim. Now that conjures up some interesting questions. Uh, yeah. What would that be? Wouldn't you like for an archaeologist to <laughs> dig one of those up? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'd like to see uh, what Solomon actually put into to solid gold form. Or what would the chariot of the cherub, uh, cherubim be? Would it be a disc? Uh, I think so. I think it would have the appearance, in fact, we talk about uh, Ezekiel a, a lot in this article. And Ezekiel saw a whirlwind coming across uh, the plain by the river Kibar. And he thought of it as a fiery whirlwind. And as it approached, it took on a form that was apparently disc-shaped. It was wheel-shaped. And in fact, it's referred to as a wheel. And it apparently landed on the ground right in front of him, and it was accompanied by four 
cherubs who seem to be bearing it up. Now, in my opinion, this would be the chariot of the cherubims. Mm -hmm. Let's continue our discussion about, about cherubs. And we were talking about Ezekiel a moment ago. Ezekiel 1 uh, and verse 4 uh, says, and, and I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud of fire enfolding itself, and, and the brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. So he sees a fiery, what I think is a disc. And I want to quickly say, I'm not talking about uh, 21st century UFOs here necessarily. Uh, I think that the whole UFO phenomenon in our century may involve fallen angels, but that's another story. But he certainly saw a flaming wheel. Now, Daniel described the Ancient of Days, out of whose throne came fiery wheels or wheels of fire. And I think that perhaps these are the chariots of the cherubim that, that we're looking at here. Uh, because Ezekiel says in the fifth verse of his first chapter, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was the, their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, everyone had four faces, everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, the sole of their feet was like a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Well, <clears throat> here's uh, something with a calf's foot, a cloven hoof, and faces like... Uh, animals and like men. They're a combination of Earth's living creatures and they seem to be bearing aloft this wheel of fire which after it settles down and stops, we discover, has a throne. And sitting in that throne is one who looks like the Son of Man. It's got to be the throne of God, J.R. And it's yeah. the chariot of the cherubims. Is it something Jesus flies? I think he must. Amazing. You know, when he went back to heaven, as recorded in the book of Acts, he was taken aloft in a cloud. Yeah. Well, it said, um, this one you're talking about in Ezekiel, uh, that sitting beneath a canopy of sorts in a crystal domed uh, mm -hmm. fashion is a throne, and on the throne, one likened to the Son of Man, that would be Jesus, wouldn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> so he flies the chariot of the cherubims. Now, now in Isaiah chapter 6, yeah. we have the seraphim. Right. And they are the flaming ones. Do right. they have anything to do with this fiery chariot? Well, you know, I looked into the history of the seraphs to see what differences there are between them and, and the cherubs. And as nearly as I can tell, they are the same creature in different, serving in different functions. Uh, mm -hmm. At least authorities seem to think the seraphs and the cherubs are, are identical creatures in different uh, uh, roles or playing different roles. I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but the fiery, the word seraph in Hebrew means fiery. Mm -hmm. A flaming angel uh, was associated with temple worship in the days of the kings. And Isaiah experienced one of these uh, who visited him in uh, in the temple while, or near the temple while he was praying. Well, we like to think of angels in heaven and, you know, they are the, oh, shall we say, they keep heaven looking beautiful. And yeah. They have things to do. God sends them here and there and they work for the Lord. They serve right. the Lord throughout eternity. Um, but then we really like to get into the idea of what they do for us because uh, people can entertain angels unaware. So uh, angels can come down and look like people. They can. And they can do various things for us and help us, uh, guide us along the way, put two people together. I think of angel angels as messengers and servants. That's what they seem to be in the Bible. They're God's servants sent out to do various tasks. That they carry uh, God's message uh, to the people from time to time. Before we get away from this cherubic idea, one last thing about Ezekiel, and then we're going to talk about the old cherub who fell, and that would be Lucifer, uh, who's now known as Satan. When this vehicle, this celestial transportation vehicle, came to Ezekiel, Ezekiel was later given a ride. He was picked up in Babylon and taken over to Jerusalem. And he says, Then the Spirit took me up and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing 
saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures touched one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, the noise of a great rushing. Now, this is very graphic to me. Yes. It's like a, a jet takeoff or something, you know. And and he says, so the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And and I could read the rest, but the long story short is that it took him back over to Jerusalem. And he's given a bird's eye view of Jerusalem. So the chariot of the cherubims is a reality. Look, that's essentially what I want to say here. Now, one of the things you wrote about this in your article is that he felt the G-forces. He did. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, let's see, I think I left that out. Oh, yeah. Uh, he says, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. And as I read that in context, <laughs> it, you know, it's like yeah. a force was pushing down on him while all this rushing was going on. And I thought to myself, wow, that's familiar. <laughs> so he actually felt the, the G-forces of the atmosphere or uh, gravity forcing against his yeah. body as he p was propelled forward in this craft. And so the craft, if you will, and we could call it the char chariot of the cherubim, is God's personal throne, which is able not just to be in one place in heaven, but to move about. And this brings us then to the fact that there are four cherubs around that throne, but there used to be another one. Yeah. The other one it was known as Helel, and which is translated into Latin as Lucifer, meaning light bearer or light bringer. Or Helel means sparkling light or flashing light, something very brilliant. And that was his name when he was the anointed cherub. In fact, we read in Ezekiel 28, 14, where the Lord speaks of him as the anointed cherub that covereth. And the Lord says, I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So this means, J.R., that this cherub called Halel or Lucifer must have been around the throne of God with the other four until iniquity was found in him and he fell out of that position. Now there are only four of them. There used to be five. Now, that's fascinating. The great red dragon. The great red dragon. So the other four, if they are um, the watchers over the wild beast, that would be the lion, mm -hmm. the calf, uh, which would be the domesticated animals or tame animals. Mm -hmm. uh, man, um, which would be, you know, the dominant species on the planet. And then the birds, uh, depicted by an eagle. This one that looks like a dragon or serpent would uh, be, uh, would have been over the Saurian kingdom. Yes. The kingdom that has been greatly diminished we can find bones of all these giant dinosaurs. Uh, it looks like they were all judged when he was judged, doesn't it? We get in a very strong way, archaeology is dinosaurs. <clears throat> they are the big attraction. If you're an archaeologist and find a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton, you, you are in the chips. I mean, that's what everybody wants to see is these giant reptiles that used to dominate this earth. And J.R., I can't help believing that, that their leader, that their chief watcher, uh, was none other than Halel or Lucifer, as he was called. And he was a reptile. Once a reptile, always a reptile. He was created as a reptilian being. Uh, he's still a reptile to this very day. He's called that old serpent. And he, instead of presiding over this magnificent kingdom of, of dominant Saurians now presides over a kingdom of snakes and frogs and toads and lizards and all of those things we find so repulsive. The little creeping things. <laughs> little creeping <laughs> things. So he's, he's not such a big shot anymore. Is that what That's you're saying? That's what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Well, uh, not to dwell too long on the negative, um, 
we find that the scripture tells us that one of these days he's going to be bound with chains and, and thrown into the bottomless pit. And uh, then following that, of course, uh, after the thousand years, the seventh millennium of mankind, he will be loosed again for a little season and then will be thrown into the lake of fire. Mm. So <clears throat> his end is going to be quite inglorious, isn't it? Indeed. And there's an interesting note <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Paul's writing to the Corinthians and, and, and reminding them of who they are in Christ. And he says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now, we're going to judge the angels one day. We, we know from the book of Hebrews that Jesus is better than the angels, for a one specific reason, of course there are probably an infinite number of reasons, but one reason is that he's genealogically called the Son of God. Now, none of the angels are called the Son of God. Right. They're, they are created beings. Uh, we, who are safe in Christ and have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, have been adopted, and so that we're going to be, we're going to come into the family of God also as sons, and we'll, we shall be glorified the same way that Christ is glorified, and we'll be above the angels. So this illustrates something that I find interesting. Peter says, concerning prophecy, First uh, Peter one twelve, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you uh, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Which things the angels desire to look into. And the language here, J.R., in the original Greek is the angels are deeply curious about human matters. They don't understand it. Uh, in the end, we're going to understand a lot more about life than the angels do. And you would think they would know a lot because they live in heaven where God lives. Yes. That they would be uh, PhDs and hold master's degrees and go to the University of Heaven. Sure. Um, you would think that they would know a lot, but let's face it, folks, listen to me. A third of the angels were duped. Boy, they must have been dumber than dirt to be duped yes. so easily by Lucifer. Lucifer presented his case, and they thought it sounded pretty good, which means that they, as we might think of it, they were not doctrinally well-grounded, and they followed the wrong man. But when you get to looking at the human race these days, <laughs> oh, yeah. my, aren't we a lot like those angels? I have a yeah. feeling, Gary, that more than a third of the human race has been duped. Sad to far say. Far more than a third. Yeah, far more. Wow. Well, listen, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, get smart, will you? Wise up. Understand that Jesus loves you so much that he came and died for you, and he wants you to be saved. So repent of your sins. Ask the Lord to forgive you and save you. He will, you know. He loves you. Hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on angels. I'm J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Bob Ulrich, Gary Stearman's partner and the co-founder of Prophecy Watchers. I would love to tell you how you can become a subscriber to our wonderful Prophecy Magazine, creatively named The Prophecy Watcher. And ready for this? How you can get eight powerful Prophecy DVDs as a free bonus for subscribing today. Every day, the ancient prophecies of the Bible get more and more exciting as we watch world events come into perfect alignment with the words of the ancient prophets. Examine the pre-trib rapture doctrine taught by the Apostle Paul. Come to a deeper understanding of the giants of Genesis 6 and the real reason for the flood of Noah. Read the shocking things we see coming out of the world of science and technology, mind-blowing advances in transhumanism and artificial intelligence. Keep a close eye for a series of wars coming very soon to the Middle East. The Bible's a supernatural book, and we enjoy covering the fringe subjects and dark corners of Scripture as well. UFOs, the Nephilim, the miracles of the Bible, and so much more. 
It's a one-of-a-kind publication full of articles that will make you a Bible prophecy expert and prepare you for the future. We have a very special subscription offer for you today for your gift of $50 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers. You can subscribe to either the digital version or the print version of our magazine. And here's the best part. In addition to receiving 12 monthly issues of the magazine, this offer comes with a fantastic bonus. Eight DVDs from some of the leading prophecy experts in the world today. Eight DVDs plus 12 issues of the magazine represents a $200 value, but it's available today for your gift of just $50 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers. This offer is available anywhere in the USA and will ship both the magazine and the DVDs absolutely free. Don't wait or hesitate. Call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to take advantage of this limited time offer. Looking at the future through the lens of Bible prophecy is the entire focus of this ministry. We're motivated like never before by our desire to tell the world that Jesus is the only answer for these troubling times. And we do believe that He's coming back very soon, just as He promised. Partner with us today. Help us take God's message of salvation through Jesus Christ to the whole world.